everybody. Right on time again. The most reliable podcast in the history of computers and talking. And <laughs> the history of talking. Pods. <laughs> wherever that term came from. Casting in yet another pod here with my good friend Ursula. Uh, such a good friend that oh, she uh, doesn't elevated. ever show up for these. Hmm? Um, you know, that's how real friends are. They're real. They're real. <laughs> <laughs> it's and true really imaginary busy. friends are incredibly punctual and reliable <laughs> yes they are they show up whenever you imagine them yep yeah that's what you need imaginary friends uh, i mean honestly i'm just gonna start learning to impersonate your voice and just do these there myself there you go that's i'm why, just kidding it's much. hard enough it's hard enough to get myself to do them with a friend <laughs> <laughs> let alone by myself yeah you have no one to like ask you hey are we gonna do it oh no that's you uh, yeah, exactly. I got that part covered because no one else is going to do it. Okay, guys. Uh, if you love this um, irregular, uh, infrequent show and you, you just want to show us how much you love us and you would love us to keep doing it, you can go to patreon.com slash catalyst athletics and you can be uh, one of those people who gives a dollar a month or five dollars a month or two dollars and 33 cents a month you can make it any amount you want that you're comfortable with financially and also feel uh tells us the message that you are trying to communicate that you love us and you don't want us to quit uh you can also go to itunes or whatever you listen to on and do a review of this thing but only if it's a good review if you want to post a bad review then we don't want those we're not interested in accuracy. We're interested in inflating uh, how good we look. Well, it's a good thing they can't see us then. I had a guy years ago. I, I did some kind of contest or something to give away something. And part of it was you had to post a, a book review on Amazon for, for my book. And I, I forget what exactly. It was on Facebook or something back when Facebook mattered. Uh, it was something like, you know, enter you go post a good review or something like that and he just like teed off on me like you can't force people to post good reviews like they're gonna post whatever review you want and i said i'm not forcing you to post a good review but i'm being real honest and saying if you post a bad review you're not eligible for this contest because why the <laughs> fuck would i reward you for that stupid god <laughs> Well, I just feel like yeah. Go go give me a one star review in my book, and I'm gonna send you something free. Thanks, I'll send pal. You a free book. I'll send you another book. Why don't I just invite you over to my well, house? You can be... punch me in the face. I'll give you all my shit. <laughs> uh, I feel like you were sensitive about that. I guess the point is I'm sensitive to people post. being stupid. Well, it's very upsetting to me because I feel like it's not that hard to not be I mean, a dick. If you're <laughs> live in this world you may want to get over that yeah well what get, uh, get over living in this world yeah no, get <laughs> that's over a good suggestion <laughs> get over to get over have we colonized mars yet well we might be the first to go and then we can start a uh, podcast there i just hope everyone else goes and i'll stay here <laughs> i'm quite comfortable <laughs> with you know air <laughs> we have never and water you know some you are how much you loathe other people I like don't loathe them. I'm just constantly disappointed <clears throat> because I feel like it's not that hard to be cool. Is it? Like, how hard is it to just be, like, polite and have basic courtesy and, like, I don't know, think about what you're saying before you say it and not be a shitbag to other people? Really, really high expectations of the human race at this uh, point. Evidently, I just, that's the, the, the crux of the problem here is that that shouldn't be a high expectation. Well... I'm not expecting you to snatch 200 kilos. Just say your pleases and thank yous and don't be an asshole. What is so hard about that? Well, don't ask me. I don't know. I totally abide by all of that all the time. I know. That's why we're still friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really has been a, quite a long time at this point. I want to reevaluate. <laughs> or, you know, how they put sunset clauses on laws. We may want to. Yeah, we got to re up every three this. years. We're going to reauthorize. To have someone do we'll, not just a review. We'll take this to um, committee and uh, yeah, get some. We'll do an uh, evaluation. And then we can, ev we can evaluate the evaluation. And then we can get a committee to evaluate the evaluation of the evaluation. 
It sounds yeah, like a they good plan. College. It is. That's how they create all those stupid ass bureaucratic jobs. But I'm going to stop there. Did I tell you I'm going to leave my job teaching at the community college? You did. I guess I should probably tell them that. But I. Um, well, a little late. You already did. Uh, nah, nobody from there listens to this. They don't even know what weightlifting is. I. Um, <laughs> There's their problem. <laughs> Yeah, they don't leave. Yeah, and you can tell. But I, um, yeah, I've been teaching at that college since 1989. And I taught kinesiology from 94 until 2013. And then I've been teaching in the government department since 2004. And I'm part time, I'm adjunct faculty. But it's just hard with the travel schedule for weightlifting to, you know, keep up with teaching without having to deal with students. Or, like, not feel like I'm not. Teaching without having to deal with students. Yeah, I don't want to. There's an inherent problem here. Uh, no, I mean, like, not having to deal with them complain about me getting subs and that kind of stuff. Which, I mean, I understand. But really, the the real reason I'm, I'm going to leave is because, I, you know, I kind of get treated like shit sometimes. And I had this great department chair. He was awesome. And he was really appreciative of the, like the work that I'm doing, especially since it is politically related. I, I just don't, everybody in government thinks that the only type of government is, you know, state and U.S. local government. They don't understand that there's also sports governing bodies and that maybe I don't, you know, work with, you know, I'm not on a city commission or something, but I work in the wor- world of sports governing and sports politics. And I mean, he kind of got it, kind of. But they just don't place any, you know, importance on that. And all they see is that I'm, I'm hiring a sub, which I'm paying. Um, but I, I have a new department chair and just kind of rude. And I was like, you know what? I've fucking dedicated my whole life to this stupid ass college. Um, and then you're going to be fucking rude to me. So and what it's annoying is that and this happens in, in coaching, too. And I know you understand what I'm talking about but people who are newer than you getting some position and then being shitty to you you know it's like I've been around here fucking three times as long as you have I'm like not trying to rule the world I'm just want to do my job and then they shit on you so it seems like like you have really high expectations Ursula yeah be fucking normal don't be rude that's another was exactly what I was just talking about two minutes ago that you seem to find uh, so absurd. <laughs> no, it is absurd. See what happens? Like, you know, you have those expectations and you get a new department chair and all of a sudden you're like, what? What? Why is this happening? Expect just, constant disappointment. That's what yeah, I've learned I in 39 my years. I department chair back. He was the best. Uh, and I've had like really good administrative, um, you know, leaders there or bosses, I guess you want to call them. Um, department chairs and all the d- division um, deans and all of that have been always really pretty cool and laid back and I mean it's a community college let's not act like we're teaching at fucking Berkeley and you know you get every once in a while somebody who's like I'm a you know fucking pseudo intellectual that they think that they're really an intellectual so I'm yes. like, we work in a fucking community college. Like, yeah, but whoa. Ursula, they're they're at the real colleges too. I've been to both. I've been to multiple yeah. colleges. <laughs> they're yeah, no, everywhere. I think, you know, like if at major universities, like I remember going in, and I won't say the department, but I was looking at another uh, potential major for my graduate for my master's degree, and I I went into one department to speak with one of the department chairs. She was a real bitch. She's like, you know, this is very very hard. I'm like. <laughs> no fuck like it should be if it's going to be like, uh, you know, this program is very hard I'm like I was in your program I made all A's me and one other dude that went to the DLI I guess now it's a big giveaway but well, anyway, yeah I'm going to leave that job so I am I belong to y'all now yeah well we'll I, all believe I that when, to, we, when we see no, I belong to the weightlifting world only at this point Okay. so hopefully they'll thank me by Somebody giving me some goddamn money so I can pay my bills. Yeah, we'll see. Hold your breath. Maybe that two thirty. I know, right? We'll see. I'll probably be working at the college next semester again. Yeah, you'll be like, you'll be working the hot dog cart in the quad or something. <laughs> hey, be like, yeah, we got a job for you. <laughs> You're like, when the department chair hears this, yeah, and is like, 
Yeah, you're fired. No, he, I don't think he actually has the ability to fire me. And if he does, too too late, I'm going to quit. I was going to say, you can't <laughs> fire someone who doesn't work for you. All right. Okay, now that our uh, opening therapy session is one... Uh, Are you sure you got dis- all out of your system? Disappointed customer called it. Uh, we can move on to weightlifting topics. Yeah, I don't. I my system is gonna overflow forever, so I gotta just stop it at some point. <laughs> do you <laughs> want to do the grand the grand purge the sooner? The sooner. No, the grand purge is reserved for the day before I retire. Ooh, is that gonna be a podcast? Uh it's gonna be no. a multimedia extravaganza. <laughs> It's, going, going, it's going to be YouTube on now. many platforms, yeah. many different media. Meltdown. Oh, it's it's not going to be a coming. meltdown, and it's going to be very premeditated and very controlled. But it's going to be all the things I've people. always wanted to say. Oh man, I um, I I've told some people because they think I'm, you know, kind of brazen as it is. I'm like, oh, you don't oh, say. Oh, <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet. Yeah. Wait till I no longer am restrained by the different positions that I currently hold. Seriously. Once those come off, shit's going to hit the fan. Everybody's going to be like, whoa, that crazy bitch. Anyways. Well, more so. Yeah, we just stop it. I know All they're already right. saying it. So, hey, American, uh, whatever it was, in Albuquerque. American Open Series 2. Yeah, 2. Yeah. Over what what in, about it? Al- I don't know. You want to say anything about it? No. How did y'all do that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Sarah Beth McClendon Jumper uh, made the world team alternate spot, so that's pretty exciting. Yeah. That's a first for her. Yeah. She clean and jerk. Well, like, she was on the team for, you know, until... She um, was on the team for two Hunter, days. Yeah, until Hunter um, had to put in a score to beat her second Roby. Yeah. You know, I didn't even... Well, I mean, after court kind of decided i mean she heard her back and so it was like i'm not going to push you um and you're obviously um you know if you're in pain i'm not gonna make you train and so and it's it was a an injury from before i mean it's before i started coaching her that that reappeared and so um i don't know if you remember she had it years back and it stymied her then but uh I kind of stopped looking at all the qualification stuff at that point. Yeah. I mean, I, I know kind of the, the process, but, and I didn't realize that we had sent in that, we had already sent in the preliminary entry. Like, I know that we have to. So there's a lot of, a lot of discussion going on about that. And then um, I had somebody walk up to me. Well, and then, so we were at dinner and I was talking to Phil and we found out that, in fact, uh, the other girl, Taylor, wasn't eligible even and so that put Sarah Beth on the team that was kind of exciting I mean um just to see the expression on Sarah Beth's face uh to know you know that she there was a potential of course Hunter Lamb had to outscore her the second Roby and I guess Sarah Beth didn't have a second Roby did she Uh, no she did not right so or did she no she did but it wasn't from an international meet so that's where it got confusing oh yeah but I so think I that I think that was true for Hunter too. She her only score as a fifty. She'd only done one other meet as a fifty nine. Yeah. I think that's why it got it came down the way it did. Yeah. So then Hunter did what she needed to do, which was, you know, good for her. And um, anyways, no, there was other chatter. I was sitting there and there's the always chatter. Comes, <laughs> yeah, I know it's ridiculous. Kind, of, I mean, like really. Um, and I, you know, you try not to be, you try to be peripheral to it all. But Jody said to me one time, like, "How do you get sucked into all these things?" I'm like, "I'm not trying to." How do you not? Girl, uh, yeah. Like you're just constantly yeah. surrounded by it. Yeah. Um, well, you know, like I don't go on Reddit at all Why anymore. Would you? Like I went, yeah, no, I went on it once to go defend my name because I was fucking being libeled all over the place. Yeah, but it's um, pointless. Yeah, absolutely, because you've got a bunch of you know, keyboard warriors that don't even go to meets. Like, are you even a USAW member? Like, what is your fucking deal? But anyways, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, so many people had sent me stuff that how, like, just fucking just stupid shit that people were saying. Anyways, I was sitting there and an athlete, you know, a normal athlete came up to me and said, so what do you think about it? I'm like, think about what? And they're like, um, or oh, what, what do you think about what's going on? I'm like, what's going on? What is, yeah. 
It's like a million things like, going on. Can we narrow it yeah. down a little bit? Yeah, and she and I guess there was a uh, talk about um, the fact that uh, what's her Maddie didn't have a great meet, and yep. she was you know had, yeah, and so I was like. So you know about Maddie. I'm like, what about Maddie? Like, she's on the world team. What's the what's the yeah. discussion about? She didn't have a great meet. She's the one who's still so, on the world team because she's, yeah, she's done what she team. needed to do. Right. And she's coming so, off a freaking back injury. Like, give the girl yeah. two minutes before you start talking shit again. No that girl gets beat shit. up on more than it's anybody. Ridiculous. It is ridiculous. I mean, it, it dry. It, it's starting to fucking really get on my nerves. So. And I was, I was really perplexed by the question, like, so what do you, you know, what do you think about what's going on? And I'm just like, really, is that the topic of conversation? I mean, she's I on think the we need to move world on. Team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, what, I mean, she's been one of the best lifters in the United States for a long fucking time. And here's the funniest part, too. It's like the lifter she was going head to head with had the exact same performance. She went one for six. Also, no one's talking shit about her. Like, uh, yeah. and Maddie's the one on the team. Right. So, like, if you're going to talk shit about a bad performance, how about you have the same shit talking about the same bad performance from two lifters? Yeah. At least Maddie was coming back from a back injury and had, like, a reason. She hadn't been well, able to the, train I, heavy at well, all. That was the, the first one, time. Just, um, the other one was doing what we know happens when somebody's trying to bump somebody off a world team. You know, she's looking at what do I need and putting the number on the bar. Yeah, and like, what Maddie you know, did was exactly what she needed right. to do. She put the pressure on the person who was trying to bump her off and yeah. got her to not bump her off. Yeah. People should be applauding that, not yeah. moving well, so lame. I don't lame. think people understand fully like, how weightlifting strategy. works, no. <laughs> yeah, no, they don't understand like coming in with some idea of what you're capable of and then a strategy to do it. Oh, that was that was the other good one is in that Reddit thread. Someone was like, oh, it's, it's kind of shady, you know, to make a change like that and rob someone of their two-minute clock. Yeah, it's super shady to do what? an extremely commonly used, perfectly legal strategy. Are you fucking Wait, joking? So Y'all took a one minute clock. At you know, some point. Yeah, it's just so ridiculous. Clock. Here's the deal. If you don't take somebody's two minute clock and you're the coach. You're an idiot. Coach. Yeah. It, there's a reason that's in the rules. It's meant to be my used. Best fucking friends twice at the Olympic team trials. And I love her to death. But we're competing. Yeah, it's a competition, I, and those are the rules. If you're not using the rules to your advantage, you're a bad coach. Right. Uh, so anyway, yeah. yeah. Let me let me help them lift the bar. Fuck, I'll go load it for you. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you your ammonia. You know. Seriously, hey, you want a fourth attempt? How about you know that? I said, yeah, I'll, I'll write your programming so you get better. Uh, Good God. Speaking of, aren't our questions about programming? We I have questions. So boring. <laughs> Shut oh, I up. thought we were done. <laughs> this is going to go down in the history of the worst episode ever. It's like the uh, angriest episode. I'm not even angry. I'm just irritated. Liar. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> what's, what's, the, what's the line in that Avengers movie? Is That's my secret. I'm always angry. That's me, except it's not a secret. <laughs> It's pretty fucking we obvious. Such a good time, though, right? It's pretty obvious. It, Ursula gives me any cue. She's like bananas, and then I start yelling for five minutes. <laughs> it's a fucking apple. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay, all right. Let's 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 get at least one question done so we can pretend that we're doing a weightlifting podcast. Is that fair? We were talking about weightlifting. We were talking about barely, <laughs> barely. Well, it was you know tangential. Yeah. Okay. It was well, it was weightlifting orientated. I apologize to all the unaccomplished virgins on Reddit for making you feel did bad you about me? yourself, but you did it to yourselves. But did you hear me? I what? said it was weightlifting orientated. Oh, oh stop it! <laughs> stop right now. <laughs> you know, inside jokes don't work. They really don't. Not on a podcast. No, it's like making a facial expression right now. It's not going to help. <laughs> Okay. All right. All right, Jay. I'm we'll, that was an attempt to get under Greg's skin. We're, we're, yeah, well, that's really tough. That's a, that's a big accomplishment. <laughs> Didn't even fucking work. I'm, I'm very thick skinned. It's just that everything is already under it. <laughs> <laughs> 
it bounces off my thick skin, but it's bouncing off the inside and it like, aggravating me. It's like having a fucking chigger. <laughs> yeah. All right. Jay, Jay says, we're just going to this question. Jay says, hi, coaches. Okay. Love the podcast. Wanted to ask about periodization within a week, specifically in regard to fatigue management through exercise selection. When researching it in relation to powerlifting, it seems much easier since the lifts are more discrete systems as opposed to the classic lifts. Considering in weightlifting, you're almost always squatting, pulling, and overhead, do you have a preferred organization of the lifts throughout the week? I assume it in large part depends on the focus of the cycle, but didn't know if you had any general rules. Ursula, I'm going to come over there and just fucking scream in your face. Uh, you like to follow. In addition, because weightlifting requires a heavy emphasis on technique, how do you organize technique emphasis relative to more strength-oriented days? Thanks. Just as some quick background, before we got on the show, Ursula's phone was ringing for 20 minutes straight. And I was like, why don't you just unplug it? She's like, no, no, I muted it. Clearly, you didn't. Which is funny because that happened before two years ago when I begged you to just unplug your phone. No, I muted it. And then it kept ringing. You know, what's, what's funny is one of the phones is unplugged. It's just not this one. Just not the one that matters. <laughs> Well, there's a phone in another room that the microphone can't pick up and that's unplugged so we're all good well it would be even louder if it was plugged in oh my god i can't reach the plug it's i'm gonna make you swallow that phone <laughs> i need it for my fax machine <sighs> okay you have to reread that question because it was possibly the fucking longest question i've ever heard on our podcast oh my god it, it and, wasn't and though my, <laughs> it was though and my phone was Strike. Okay, are you ready? Are you ready to pay yes, attention? I'm ready. I gotta write stuff down. Okay. Oh my god. Okay, Sorry. wanted to ask about periodization within a week, specifically in regard to fatigue management through exercise selection. When researching it in relation to powerlifting, it seems much easier since the lifts are more discrete systems as opposed to the classic lifts. Considering in weightlifting you're almost always squatting, pulling, and overhead, do you have a preferred organization of the lifts throughout the week? I assume it in large part depends on the focus of the cycle, but didn't know if you had any general rules you'd like to follow. In addition, because weightlifting requires a heavy emphasis on technique, how do you organize technique emphasis relative to more strength-oriented days? Did you get all that? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to fax a copy over to you? Yes, but you can. See, that's the wonder, the wonderful thing. I don't even. I just at this point, I don't even know what else to do with you, Ursula. <laughs> answer the question. You sat there and took notes. Now I expect no, a I really good answer. You so, took notes on the uh, question that you have a copy of already? Oh, yeah, but it's on my phone. My phone's off. Because um, I didn't want my cell phone to ring. Oh, so. no. God God forbid your cell phone makes some noise. Well, it's off. It's on. It's All right, let's hear it, lady. So, Superstar. The order of the lifts for the week. I told you I hate programming questions. They're stupid and boring. Yeah, but that's but, what everyone wants um, to hear, and we're here for the people, so not for you. The, the, I don't the care about your feelings. Can I, can I get to the order of the lifts? Can so you? asking about the order of the lifts throughout the week. So if I want to do, um, for me, when I look at the week, I usually start off with some form of the classic lifts because people are fresh. And then on the second day, I might give them partials to reduce the fatigue from that. And of course, we also have, my our training schedule is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So we already have some kind of built-in rest but most people that are you know of a higher level or train multiple times a day might need in one of those workouts a lessening of the load the actual you know volume times intensity and so you can choose exercises that are less rigorous but also but also technically oriented or orientated which one greg no oh. uh, technically oriented and so, <laughs> <laughs> so so i um i you know things like power snatch off the block or faster by virtue of not being able to lift as much in those they're going to be a lower uh, percent or lower percentage of your max so lower intensity and if i really wanted to give someone kind of a light day then i could give them power movements or i could give them movements from the hip all of those exercises that are partials um and then instead of doing are going to help lower the intensity by virtue of the type of, of exercise they are. So obviously if I'm doing hip snatch, I can maybe hip snatch at 70. If you can do 75%, that's that's really good. So if I give them at 65% or 70%, it's decent work. It's akin to maybe 80% snatches, but a lot less overall load because of the, um, the exercise 
and, and what percentage you can do of your actual one rep max. So you can choose exercises throughout the week if you ever if you know that you need to build in some rest because you're going to have some heavier days later in the week. We usually do our classic lifts fairly early in the week at, or on the, the end of the week when we've had a Friday rest day. And that kind of is, is I think, quite normal because it coincides with when somebody would normally compete, yeah. which is over the weekend. So I think most coaches tend to put classic stuff. You know, you kind of bookend it with classic stuff in the beginning when you're fresh and classic stuff at the end when you're fucking beat down. But to make sure that you're not completely beat down, you can do on either that Tuesday or the Thursday, you can work in um, some partials or powers, uh, work off the block. It still gives you the technique emphasis um, and of course, for pulls, you can always substitute that with lighter RDLs. You can do, and we always do some one-legged work. So either a step up or a front rack one-legged squat or a Bulgarian split squat. Like one of those exercises that will still, and actually very useful because it helps to try to maintain some symmetry and strength for you know each side. And um, yeah, I mean. I, I would just throw in some, and you can combine them too. So if I know I'm going to go heavy in one lift, uh, just to reduce the overall uh, intensity and load for that day, I would say do a muscle snatch to warm up and then a heavy clean and jerk. Um, just to kind of build in uh, this buffer so that I don't have, you know, heavy snatch, heavy clean and jerk and a back squat. Uh, in terms of like combining exercises, most of us do a snatch, a clean and jerk, a front, a, a squat, and a pull in a workout. That's common in a press, or um, some combination of those. Um, you know, four out of the five, if not all five. Um, and so I think when you are are looking at that, one of my general rules is not to put back squat with clean pull. Or um, so normally I'll have front squat and snatch pull, uh, front squat and clean pull together, and I'll usually put my back squat with my snatch pull because when you're looking at the the load that's created, if you take your heaviest exercise, uh, classic exercise, a clean and jerk, and you combine it with a clean pull, which is going to be your your heaviest pulling movement, uh, unless you deadlift, that would be heavier. But we just do clean pulls that you know look like uh, deadlifts that look like clean pulls, or vice versa. Um, and uh, back squat, you've now created a, a really difficult um, or a large amount of load just by choosing those exercises and unless you go really light like you would see in a recovery week, um, like the last couple of weeks before uh, the competition where we're typically doing full classic movements again combined with lighter speed work, but you're... Um, doing the full movements as you get closer in. So like if you're looking at an entire uh, programming cycle, you'll see those lifts come in, the classic lifts, primarily uh, towards the end of the strength phase. And then you start doing more and more classic lifts between in the strength phase uh, going into the beginning of your power phase. And so as the number of those lifts, then you might see you know a reduction in the intensity. But when you first bring them in, you can bring them in um, with, at a higher intensity while you're reducing your volume, but not do them so often. So I tend to work on partials in the beginning of a cycle uh, combined with a lot of conditioning. So more volume on the pulls and, and squats with a, a lower intensity and then move into the higher. T and I'm getting off topic now because I'm, I'm moving into a 16-week cycle and thinking about that and the placement of the, the different types of exercises that you would use. But within a week, if you go down to within a week, if you need to make some accommodation because you're trying to get a specific result at the end of the week, like you want them to be more, more recovered, then doing what would be normally found in a, you know as speed exercises, power snatch or technical exercises like a hip snatch or snatch from power position or pull under, things like that, um, are just going to be inherently lighter. Okay, I'll shut up now. Okay. I hate, I hate uh, questions. Yeah, agreed. Uh, my my simple brain kind of looks at it like this. If I'm looking at a week, a typical week, as in like typical loading training week, not a tapering week, not a back off week, whatever. I want to al essentially alternate every other day with kind of like big heavy day, smaller light day, 
right? It doesn't get any simpler than that. So for if you're my typical training schedule for an athlete, if there's no other reason to do otherwise would be Monday through Thursday, Friday off train, Saturday, Sunday off. Um, we may do Monday through Wednesday, take Thursday off, train Friday, Saturday, but it's essentially going to be the same for what I'm about to say. So, and that it, is the that last one that you mentioned, the the Thursday Sundays off mm-hmm. is uh, it's kind of I mean that's textbook Soviet. That's what they used to do, where Thursdays and Sundays were reserved for recuperation. Yeah, and uh, honestly, I don't like it, and I don't. I prefer having Fridays and Sundays off, um, mm-hmm. which I'll kind of explain the layout. Number one, that's how. I trained with my coach. I know that's like how John Thrush typically set it up. That's how Kyle Pierce typically set it up. So it's it's not a weird thing that just I do. I got it from other people who are smarter than me. Um, but I do have some athletes who do do the Thursday and Sunday off because that's just how they have to train because of their schedules and it, well, yeah, it works at some, fine. At some at some level, you have to accommodate you know real lives, yeah, which no. in the what Soviet era they didn't have, they didn't they didn't have real lives. Yeah, you were just indentured no. servants, right? Um, well, slaves really, but yeah. So, uh, servants. so w- typically, what I'm going to see is that Monday, Wednesday, Saturday is going to be my heaviest loading uh, in terms of both uh, volume and intensity, uh, and then Tuesday, Thursday will be my lighter loading in terms of intensity and volume. And so, uh, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, we're going to have you know, classic lift variations, either the full lifts or heavy variations. So not, not powers, not, you know, light technique stuff, but either from the floor, from the blocks, complexes, something where we're going to be loading pretty heavy and it's going to be taxing. Uh, we're going to have our heavier pulls, uh, pull variation. So any kind of pulling or deadlifting stuff, and we're going to have heavier squats, and then on your Tuesday, Thursday, your light day, we're going to have, like Ursula was saying, power variations, more technical oriented stuff. Um, if we have poles, they're going to be, you know, speed oriented. They're not going to be heavy loading. It's going to be all about, you know, moving that bar fast, uh, more for technique and speed versus actual strength. Um, uh, probably more overhead stuff. So that's uh, typically on those days we'll, you'll see a lot of like uh, jerk specific stuff, you know, push pressing, overhead squat, snatch balance, that kind of thing where um, they can be tough exercises, but as far as what they do to the body systemically, they're not super taxing. Um, you know, a, he- a really well, heavy let, snatch let me, balance let me, is hard, but just, it's not like a heavy clean yeah. jerk. Let, let me um, add something there because I, I, I just want to, before I forget, so there's a, a physiological, you know, like muscular uh, fatigue that can set in, but there's also that neurological fatigue. And the, the one thing that you're, that Greg's really hitting on is that when you go to that day, like a lighter day, and if you want them to be more recovered for Wednesday, because you know they're going to have classic work again and it's going to be a uh, higher intensity, uh, or you're going to have more volume on those days, looking at both, like, you know, am I squatting heavy or... Um, you know, which is creating a physiological stress and fatigue. But you also have to look at the neurological fatigue from um, Monday if you did classic lifts. And so Tuesday, doing stuff that is less taxing on the neuro, the neuro, neurological system um, is also rest. Right. It's brain rest. So, okay, sorry. Well, and I mean, in, in some sense, you can look at it as active rest too, because you're going to get a lot of times you're going to get more out of kind of a light training day than you would from a complete rest day. Like you're going to feel better the following day for a heavy day if you train, um, as long as it's an appropriate dosing of volume and intensity versus just sitting around on the couch watching TV all day. That's like one of the worst things you can do to feel good, you know, to lift heavy the next day. Um, like Ursula suggested, I use Saturday or if we have the Thursday off thing, I use Friday as a day that we do heavy snatch and clean and jerk. Doesn't always mean heavy singles, but a lot of times it is, uh, it maybe it's going to be heavy complexes, you know, snatch pull plus snatch or clean plus front squat plus jerk, something like that, depending on where we are in a, in like what kind of phase we're in, but it's going to be a tough day. And I, almost always have both snatch and clean and jerk on that day because I feel like one of the worst things you can do if you want to be a competitive lifter is never train heavy snatch and clean and jerk together. Like you, you have to develop the conditioning physically and mentally 
be able to do that. You know, you'll, you'll see these people who never do it. They go to a, a competition, they hit this great snatch, and then they're completely flat for the clean and jerk, and they can't do anything. Um, they're not able to do both those things back to back. During, uh, you know, during the week, kind of depends on the lifter but uh especially the earlier on or the newer the lifter is i'll tend to group things so i'm gonna have a snatch day on monday you know a clean day on wednesday maybe a jerk day on tuesday um and you know so some kind of snatch some kind of snatch pull and then i I agree with ursula where i'll usually do a back squat on the snatch day and then a front squat on the clean day to kind of mix that up and and kind of make the the total loading a little more balanced um but that, you know, technically, it's when when you're learning and developing the the movements, you you tend to get better results if you're doing the same type of movement and those related movements together in one day versus mixing them up. Once you have pretty well developed technique, it doesn't really matter. Um, and I like doing what Ursula said is you know maybe you have a heavy on Monday, you've got a heavy snatch, but then you have you know power clean and jerk or just Mm -hmm. you know some kind of lighter clean and jerk related thing or jerks uh but then you have your heavy snatch pulls your back squats whatever it is so you're you're getting exposure in that case to both snatch and clean and jerk um, but one is clearly the emphasis and the other is, is more focused on the movement versus like trying to create a more physiological adaptation response that makes sense does that make sense you know yeah it does um you know well when i trained with a a bulgarian coach we um did snatch and clean and jerk almost every day so i put snatch (laughs) yeah shocker (laughs) yeah together a lot but i didn't have like a general conditioning um because we did high intensity so the workouts tended to be high intensity with not enough volume to really condition me um and it's interesting um, because I didn't do it multiple times a day. I would just have, you know, the one, uh, one workout a day. Thank God I didn't have multiple times a day. I would have died. But, um, I, you know, I strayed away from that for a while when I was looking at this, the, the Soviet programming that would, that's a little bit more complex in terms of using a higher number of exercises. But I've kind of drifted back towards what you're talking about. And for the same reasons of putting a snatch and clean and jerk together on, on Saturdays or Fridays, to um, ensure that there is more of the mental capacity yeah. to handle both both lifts in one day and to learn how to create adrenaline on one lift at the higher intensities to pull back and then to do that again. So there's some you know adrenal effects that you can start to try to manage if you um, put them together and the athlete kind of learns how to have both of those lifts in one day without uh, you know, burning themselves and putting all their uh, emphasis on the snatch and then just kind of getting through the clean and jerk, which I see happening to quite a lot of lifters. Well, and it's why we, you know, we'll see a lot of five or six performances where people go, you know, make all their snatches and then they only make two clean and jerks because by the third clean and jerk, their adrenaline has already started to go down and that's when you need it the most. The so other, the other thing with that. The other thing with training the snatch and clean and jerk together a lot of the time is that learning how to still get it up for clean and jerks and have good clean and jerk mm-hmm. days when your snatches so went bad. sideways. Yeah. You know, so people will fall apart. You got you only made one for three snatches. You hate yourself. You're the biggest loser ever. You still got three clean and jerks to make. You yeah. can still put up yeah. a big total and, you know, potentially medal or make the total you need for a team or whatever it is if you don't you know convince yourself that you suck and you you can't do it right so i think that's a good good lesson too yeah one of my lifters this way and we had not put snatch and clean and jerk because we were working so heavily on technique yeah um so we had not done them together so an athlete that i'm working with almost lost it over the snatch and i was about to lose my shit on her (laughs) like you cannot um and i've seen at high level athletes like um uh, at the Olympic team trials in, I want to say, it was the one in Atlanta. What year was, what Olympics was that? 96? No, oh, no, 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 not the Olympics in Atlanta. No, the trials that we had in Atlanta. Uh, oh, that was 2008. I, okay, so there was a lifter there trying to make the Olympic team, and she was like literally the best lifter that we had. I was about to lose it between, because snatches didn't, you know, she needed a certain number of snatches. She knew what she could clean and jerk, 
and she was better at the snatch and the clean and jerk. She just needed to match two lifts together. And once the snatch wasn't what she needed, she knew she was going to do more than the clean and jerk. She started losing her shit. Yeah. And I literally slapped her. I was like, you know, you have to learn how to handle a shitty snatch day, like you were saying, and still work yourself up because now you need, you know, you, now she needed to clean and jerk more. So it was like at that time that you need the mental resi- uh, strength and resilience to get through to just move on. And it's really hard when athletes. Um, don't do that on a regular basis to to be able to handle like you know some level of failure on the first lift or perceived failure on the first lift and right. still be you know then to be even more determined because that's what you want the response to be. Yeah. Um, besides the just the ability to endure um, through and, and when you think about a weightlifting meet, it's like overall load and volume is so low (laughs) compared to what you normally do in training it's just that neurological effect um from and and the adrenaline adrenaline, that is wearing yeah yeah, that is wearing you down um that that you have to train for and that's what you know doing that can do and when you think about it if i train all week my saturday might i mean that's gonna feel a lot heavier than on a competition week where I'm I'm tapering. Yeah. So the idea is that you're having to do it under a, after a week of stress, and then to still do it, which should give you some confidence on a week that you're um, recovering and you're doing lighter work through the week to you know go in and say, hey, if I could do these numbers when I was you know tired of shit, I really should be able to hit them. Yeah. Um, well, and, and to go fresh. to get back to the actual question, he's saying, you know, basically, how does this work since you're, you're, you know, squatting, pulling and doing something overhead basically every single day? Like, how is it possible you recover from that? And I've gotten that question a million times before. And the answer is because you're modulating the volume and intensity every day. And because over time, you're becoming conditioned to those movements. The thing, the thing with weightlifting, like, it's, you don't really get sore very much, right? Because it's you, the the movements are not novel. You're doing the same thing over and over and over again. It's like you don't get sore when you walk because you walk every day. Um, if you do pull-ups every day, you're not going to get sore no matter how many you do because you're so conditioned to them. Now, if you do a different exercise every single day, you're probably going to get sore from it because it's a novel thing. That's, that's what creates that extra bit of, uh, you know, the need for the muscles to recover on a structural level. So it really is primarily a neurological thing, not uh, a morphological thing. And that's why you're able to do those things every single day. And, you know, if you're training in a Bulgarian style, you're doing them pretty damn heavy every day too. Although it should be noted that even in a pure Bulgarian system, there is the expectation and the reality that there is a very uh, variance day to day. You know, basically every Mm -hmm. other day is going to be heavier or lighter. Although that lighter day may be only 5% lighter, depending on the lifter and the time. But that is just kind of the natural rhythm of things. Oh my God, what are you doing over there? I'm sorry. I get, Greg is messaging me by text while we're on. It's like over there snapping something. It's my pen. Okay, well. It's. I'm, I'm opening it and closing it. Sorry, okay, I'm going to take off the top and I'm going to set it down Shit. and I'm going to get a plastic marker and do that. Can you hear this? I want Ursula, I want you to just fold your hands and put them on the desk. <laughs> Sit there still. Uh, I if we, if we were in school, I'd be wrapping you on the knuckles with the ruler right now. <laughs> well, I'd wrap you on the face with it. Probably. <laughs> Uh, we'd, have a, we'd have a ruler fight. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. Thank God we were never in school together. Oh, All right, Jay. I think I think we got you pretty good on that one. Let's move on to, to uh, Anders. Uh, hi, Greg and Ursula. I have a question about programming. Oh, good. Ursula's excited. My uh, favorite. I am a beginner coach, and I've written my own programming for about a year and just started writing programs for clients. If an athlete does 400 reps per week, should all sets and reps over a certain percentage be counted, or should only the goal sets be counted against the weekly volume? I have tried both, and it feels like just counting the goal sets becomes very tough. I am very interested in hearing your opinions on this and programming overall. Thanks for a great podcast. Well, you're probably only going to get our opinions on this specific thing, not overall. Although, like in the last question, you had a little spill over there. Yeah, um, I'm just going to say you count everything above 70%, and then uh, I'm going to shut That's what I do. Um, okay, I, next. I, 
I will no, I will note though that there I, I know I think a lot of the, the, the Soviet stuff started at sixty percent. Um, which means if you're using like those programs, you got to be careful. Like if you're using those suggestions for, for weekly volume, uh, you better start counting where they started counting or you're going to end up with a really, really hard program, like even harder than it already is. Um, but also you got to use your discretion too, because what if like Ursula said, what if you're doing, uh, hip snatches at 65%, are you not going to count those? You should, cause those are hard. It's going to be yeah, part of yeah. the, the, uh, the total amount of taxation on the system. Yeah. So you do have to use your discretion. Like, uh, you know, what if, what if you're doing good mornings or, or RDLs and you're basing them on a percentage of your back squat? So it's 30 to 60%. Are you not going to count those? You probably should. Yes, because the relative intensity is much higher. Based right. On those exercises. So what I'm saying is you, you have to use your discretion. You have to like use your judgment. And th I mean, the simple question is, is this going to have a noticeable effect on my ability to recover like is it this is this going to require energy to recover from and that's going to be yes for pretty much everything except you know ab work and your at your little set of curls at the end or whatever else you're doing that stuff you kind of just play it by ear and you wing it um the fly by the seat of the pants method but for any any kind of barbell thing it's a good chance you, you should be counting that towards your volume unless it's something that's going to be used considerably over 70 percent and then start counting it at 70 percent because that's where it's actually going to start doing something is that do you think that's an adequate answer i do yes You're my, i thought 70 percent and above was <laughs> with a 70 percent and above with an asterisk okay uh oh this is good steph this is the perfect episode for you to be on hey greg and ursula big fan of the profanity and banter on these podcasts the first 40 percent of this is profanity and banter so you just got your your, your dream has come true uh <laughs> i'm wondering <Favorite> what <laughs> everyone else hates it but steph is into it um you know you took away my pen and so now i'm flipping my ponytail around because i just can't sit still oh apparently my God. but i sent you a video uh, <laughs> i see that <laughs> fucking <Ursula. laughs> so you can see what i do if you this, take away my I'd say it's like doing a, it's like uh, doing a podcast with ursula is like taking a five-year-old out to dinner shut where up. it's just like Sit we still, shut the fuck up, color on this thing, <laughs> stop yelling, <laughs> quit playing with your fork, quit playing with your hair, no, don't do that, stop staring at that person, <laughs> yes, I know, <sighs> and then that five-year-old just says something super profound out of the blue, that's, that's the exact experience where you're like, oh, wow, this is why we have her on the show. <laughs> well, they can't see me, like, you know doing my hair flips yeah but you just gave but yourself away well but they have no idea oh geez okay the uh, magnitude of let's this let's flipping. let's see what steph wants <laughs> okay, steph. steph is wondering what we two think contributes most to the success of a remote athlete aside from the obvious doing what the program says yeah that's a good start i'm not sure that's always obvious uh, that's true yeah. Uh, I would consider myself somewhere around intermediate level and feel like I've had success with a coach I worked with in person, even though his commitment and interest was overall pretty low. <laughs> Said coach is now moving away and I want to invest in a better coach if I'm going to be a remote athlete either way. Given that you don't get the same immediate feedback hold as on, a remote. Hold on, hold on. How does a remote, you said her, uh, her coach was remote, but he's moving away? No, she said oh, she's had okay. success with a coach she worked with in person. Okay, okay, okay. I Keep was up. like, if they're remote and they're moving away, they're still remote. Okay, they're, okay, okay. They're more remote Gone. now. <laughs> <laughs> it takes longer for the text different message to get time, to her now. Different time zones. Uh, okay. uh, given that you don't get the same immediate feedback as a remote athlete, what do you think best sets up an athlete looking to become more advanced when they don't have the ability to work with a coach in person and are still fairly new? Thanks. Okay, well, yes, number one, doing what the program says, uh, but that's that's like a, that should be a no brainer. That shouldn't even be discussed, even though it has to be with some people. Like, hey, here's a suggestion: do the thing I told you that you need to do. Um, 
the the number one thing, and I say this as someone who coaches primarily remotely for the last three years, after since we moved out of California uh, and into the wilderness. Yeah, um, no lie. Yeah, um, you have got to communicate with your coach, and you have got to take the initiative to do it. You can't wait around for them to like check in on you five times a day because very likely you are not their only athlete but they are your only coach. So the onus is on you to give them as much information as possible. And if it's too much, they'll tell you like, Hey, I get it. I don't need to know the color of your urine today. Uh, <laughs> you know, but it, 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 it's, it's the, yeah. If you're, if your urine looks like Coke, then please tell me. Yeah. Don't um, even call me. Go just call hospital. me from the ER. <laughs> give, give the nurse my phone number. Um, I, you know, I wrote down as you were saying all of that before you answered feedback, <laughs> which is what you're talking about. I, I said it first. I said it first. Yeah, I said no, that I before. Wrote I wrote it down before you even it. said it. I, I win. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that you. It's so like you said. The the reason that being coached remotely and coaching remotely is more difficult is because you don't have that face to face immediate feedback in both directions. So you're trying to make up for that as much as possible. So if you have a, a, a an athlete in person. You see them walking in the door. You see it takes them an extra 10 minutes to put their shoes on. Uh, you know, you see all the signs like, wow, they're really tired today. They're in a bad mood. Uh, you don't see that with a remote athlete. All you see is the actual set. So if you're not saying, hey, I only slept three hours last night because I had to take my cat to the vet at 3 a.m., you know, whatever it is. I need to know that because otherwise, if you train terribly that day, I'm going to think, what am I doing wrong with this program? Right. What do I need to change? And it could be the program is fine. It's just that you're responding to something totally unrelated. Uh, so, you know, give your give your coach a chance to do the best job he or she can by always, you know, communicating that kind of information. Like, you know, give them a, a sense of how things felt. Don't just say, Hey, here's, you know, my five sets of snatches. This is what they look like. Tell me these felt really easy or these felt really heavy or these felt fine. I just kind of felt inconsistent. I wasn't focused today. You know, whatever it is like that goes a long way to helping your coach determine if that program is appropriate or, you know, something needs to be changed or it's totally fine. It's perfect. You know, whatever the case is. But again, you need to take the initiative to do that. Don't wait around for them to ask you a bunch of leading questions to try to like, you know, pull it out of you. They don't have time. Uh, you know, they're probably working with multiple other athletes who are also not communicating enough. So be the one that does that. And what that's going to do for you is, is multifold, right? Number one, that you're going to get better programming. But number two, that coach is going to see that you're committed and you're engaged and they're going to naturally commit and engage more with you, right? Uh, it's very natural whether coaches are conscious of it or not that they're going to invest on pretty similar levels as each athlete. So if they have an athlete who's totally not invested, they, they skip workouts, they skip uh, exercises, they don't ever do their ab and back work, uh, they don't communicate well, you know, you hear from them once a week. That coach is gradually, if not very quickly, going to stop putting much effort into them, right? They're going to collect your money and move on with their day and focus on athletes who are putting in effort. Uh, so that's a very good way to stand out from what could be a very large group of people and get more attention and better coaching. Yep. Ursula, anything? <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> I, I always tell my athletes I meet your effort. Yeah. So if you Which put in more, fair. I put in more. And if you half-ass it, then not intentionally I half-ass it, but that's just kind of how it ends up being. Um, and, and sometimes you can mitigate that by telling your coach, oh, I've just got a lot going on. And so like I have some athletes that have families, have newborns that have, you know, a toddler and a newborn. And I know they're trying their best. But part of it is because I know them as people. I don't, one of the problems for me with remote athletes is if you never meet your coach, I think it's it's a little bit more difficult to, to understand how each, how the other communicates. Yeah. So if you're not um, giving back, you know, the amount of, of information I need, maybe you're just reserved. It's not that you don't give a shit. You're just kind of a, a reserved personality. And I would know that if I actually knew you. So like one of my rules is, if, if I'm going to coach somebody, I have to meet them. 
like no matter whether you're going to be remote or not. Um, I want to know the personality of the person that I'm working with and, um, you know, know a little bit about them and their lives, what they do and how they function, if, especially if I don't see you every day. Um, you know, not to be a plug again, but the, the book that Amy has is really good at allow, you know, has all these different um, assessments, you know, or information that you need to fill in about what you did that day, what's going on. And if you're not talking to your coach regularly or messaging back and forth, I think it's good to have all that information so that if you talk to them, because I know a lot of coaches that just, if they have a phone call with their athlete, it's usually like once a week or a FaceTime. Um, and of course, something like FaceTime is good to get like in-person coaching without the person being there. But um, it allows you to say, oh yeah, on, on that day, okay, I had, I had uh, shitty snatches, but... You know, I had just had to pick up my kid who was sick from school, and then I went to training, right? Or I, I was late to training because I, I don't know, I was behind a car accident, and I had to rush the workout. And so, I mean, if you note that stuff, you'll remember it. If you don't note it, you will not remember. Yeah. You'll just end up remembering, I didn't have great snatches that day, and you won't know why. And if you go to, like, you know, not having a conversation over a couple of weeks, then you, you won't remember at all, like, exactly what was going on each day that was affecting your workout. And if you're, if you're living a regular life, um, those would be things that you would want to include that could impact. Uh, if you almost got into a car accident, there's like a huge surge, you know, your fight or flight um, response kicks in and, and then you go to work out and you're like, you feel like shit. And it's because you just, you know, experienced something that was fairly traumatic. Um, but writing that kind of stuff down, I mean, you might remember that if you actually did wreck. Um, the relationship with the coach, which is, is basically what I'm talking about. And Greg meant, you know, feedback goes two ways. I can tell you what I see, but you have to tell me, like Greg was saying, um, what's, you know, how you feel. So feedback goes both ways. You expect feedback from your coach, and that's a reasonable expectation. But with that, um, you should expect to have to do your part, which is, uh, give necessary feedback. You don't have to tell them every aspect of your life, but you know aspects that are affecting your programming. And and I know it sounds like okay. Well, I don't want to tell my coach. And I think this is what happens. I don't want to give my coach a bunch of my excuses, you know. And there are athletes that think that way. And I mean, I kind of appreciate that. But you know, reality is reality. You know. So if you hurt your back, I need to modify your program so that it can get better. And so. Instead of waiting, and I've had um, athletes who have done this, they said, my sh they finally tell me their shoulder hurts, and I'm like, or their knee hurts or something. I'm like, well, you know, it's, I can't do overhead stuff right now because my shoulder hurts. It's like, okay, so you had some sort of an acute injury, and usually it has nothing to do with weightlifting. It's like, you know, they reached behind them to get the pacifier for their child, right. um, and they pulled their shoulder out. I had, like, a, a chronic shoulder problem from doing that. But... Um, it, it could, and then they'll tell you after that, oh, well, it's hurt for a month. It's right. like, so for the last month, that I, could drives me nuts. I could have been doing stuff to help your, you know, to make sure your shoulder heals so we don't have a month of training and pain. And sometimes your coach is going to say, how bad does it hurt? Okay, well, we have a meet coming up. If you're trying to make some team or qualify for something, you may not be able to modify to the same degree you would if it were earlier in the training. Um, but if you're doing this recreationally, your, your health comes first. So uh, unless you're, you know, a competitive nationally or internationally competitive athlete, it might be smarter to be able to preserve yourself longer and make that information known uh, well, on the front end. But even if you are competitive, make it known because uh, like well, sure. I, I constantly run into this but problem. I'm just saying you might not have to weather the storm if you're no, uh, No, not at all. But it, it, it depends on the time. And the other thing, too, is people are like, oh, I didn't say anything because I thought it was minor and it was going to go away. It's like, yeah, it was minor, and we yeah. could have gotten it to go away very quickly if you had told me, and we could have made some minor changes. But instead, you continue to beat the shit out of yourself, and now it's a major thing, and we have to completely change the programming. You know, Well, so, if people think complaining is like whining. And, I mean, there are people who are whining. Right. And, but telling somebody, like, giving honest feedback yeah. is not complaining unless you do no. it in a whiny voice, 
right? Like, right. It no, it's an objective how- thing. Hey, yeah. every time I hold a snatch overhead, the inside of my elbow hurts really bad. Can we try to do something about this? That's not whining. And any coach yeah. who says that's whining is just a fucking idiot. Yeah. So well, and I think, you know, weightlifting has this rap that you have to be super tough and you have to endure. You do, and, but and it doesn't mean you're stupid. Do. Yeah, right. Well, I don't know that people always differentiate. And so it becomes, <laughs> you know, the coach, the coach that you choose shouldn't have that mentality either. No. Oh, you're just going to have to suck it up. You know, that there is that that does exist in, in weightlifting where. But I mean, you have to take care of your body if you're going to do big lifts. Yeah. And, and, you know, sure, at the highest levels athletes go in with you know these minor injuries and pains but they're not so bad that they're changing like how they lift or if they are then they're stupid right because they're gonna end up hurting something else right so i mean and that's the whole idea like oh my my right shoulder hurts oh shit now my left hip hurts oh shit now my right knee hurts it's like yeah it's traveling across your body (laughs) so you need to um because you're compensating how you're moving so um yeah, that kind of coach athlete relationship and developing an open, a, you know, an open communication line, I think is really the basis of a good coach athlete relationship that should exist whether you're in person or not in person. And if your coach doesn't want to know anything about you or your life, then they're probably just taking your money. Yeah, there's a good chance they're just taking your money and giving you the same program they're giving every other one of their clients. Which means you you don't have to tell them anything because they're not listening anyway. (laughs) Well, and and it's something, too, if you tell them, um, okay, well, it hurts when I, you know, do a specific exercise. And then on the next week, you're doing that exact same exercise. Right, that's a pretty good giveaway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that they didn't make any kind of uh, modification in the program. Yeah, uh, I, to I, I have no access you? to a power rack. Oh, I have jerk supports every week, forever. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Nailed it. Okay. Nailed it, coach. <laughs> good thing I'm paying you 100 bucks a month. Uh, okay, that's it. We're done. We're moving oh, on really? with our lives. Oh, I thought we had another question. Yeah, we did, but we fucking talked for 25 minutes about totally unrelated stuff and wasted everybody's time. So. It was about, wait, the only thing that was unrelated <laughs> was my, my you know, community college story that I'm going to quit teaching for yeah. at least a while. At least a while. <laughs> until I'm, like, moving in with you. So tell Amy to get that little house next door cleaned up because oh. I might be there soon. That would be wonderful that we could do podcasts every day, Greg. Every day. Yeah. I can think of so many things I'd rather do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. This is all me that's become difficult to do podcasts. Oh, yeah. Greg is a, you know, overly enthusiastic. I'm enthusiastic. I'm just, you know, busy. I, I, you have nothing to do, Greg. <laughs> uh, yeah. Not much. Okay, guys. Well, thank you for bearing with us through these turgid episodes uh did you say turd episodes turgid i know I um i don't know when the next one's gonna be we're gonna do our best to get another one out as soon as we can that's the new schedule is as soon as we can here's my question what month is oh it's it's going to be august August. okay it's it's basically august by the time we're done with this it's pretty much august so we'll see you around October or so. For the okay, next yeah. One. No, uh, August is not good for me. Yeah. September, you heard September. it here. It's not me. Yeah. August looks packed. September is world. Okay. We don't we don't need to do this on the I'm podcast episode the right now. Day. Let's do this. Got- Let's do this when we're not recording. Guys, thank you very much for listening. I, I appreciate it. If you like it, stop listening to Ursula right now. Go uh, post a review on iTunes, Google Play, whatever else you listen to. I appreciate it. Patreon.com slash Catalyst Athletics. Throw us a couple bucks here and there if you can. We appreciate that. If you can't do either of those things for some reason, like you're, you're super broke or you don't have iTunes, just share these things on anything. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Make your little sister listen. I don't care what it is. Uh, all that stuff sister. really helps. All right, guys. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you next time. Ursula, say bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Your little sister. <laughs> <laughs>